This morning we have the, the joy and privilege of having Terry Broberg share with us uh, this morning. Terry's life calling is to teach God's word and to help people apply that word to their lives. And to fulfill that calling, Terry's been a part of a lot of different uh, venues as far as teaching in uh, various churches and camps and schools, Christian schools. And he has over 15 years of experience with Walk Through the Bible and teaching that. I, my first experience with Walk Through the Bible is back when I was in college, uh, 1976. Uh, that's back when Mike was, was middle-aged. But anyway, uh, I went to the walk, my first Walk Through the Bible seminar when I was 19, and uh, it changed my life. Uh, Bruce Wilkinson did the teaching, and uh, I remember it was before I went, in, went into Bible college, and I got a bigger picture of God's Word. And it really is something that has stuck with me now for 45 years, uh, that, uh, that, that journey that I started back uh, 50, almost 50 years ago. But we're really looking forward this morning to having Terry share with us, and uh, both this morning and also this afternoon. So Terry, thank you so much for coming and sharing with us. Would you please give Terry a warm welcome this morning? Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. It's just a great privilege to be here with you. I'm so glad that we could just spend some time together. I drove from all the way in Bonnie Lake, down the valley, across the valley, to Stelicum, sat in line. <laughs> Got onto the ferry, went upstairs, and all seven of us sat up there together. And I got off the ferry and I thought, oh, this is so nice, so peaceful. What a privilege you have to live here. I have to admit, though, I was a little concerned. Because as I was driving off the ferry into the terminal, there were eight cars on the ferry and 20 lined up to leave the island. And I thought, do they know something I don't know? <laughs> but you're here, so I guess we're okay. It's so good to be together. It's my privilege to share with you the Old Testament, that part of the Bible, the part before Christ. But Christ has his fingerprints all over it. So the whole point of the Old Testament is to let us understand we need Jesus. And then the New Testament says, he's here! Yeah! That's good. And then he starts the church, and for 2,000 years, the name of Jesus has been spread around the world. Thanks for giving that little introduction to me. I always have to be careful because they don't want to put too much gravy on a little bit of potatoes. <laughs> but uh, it has been my privilege to teach with Walk Through the Bible for a number of years now. And I just got a new job a year and a half ago. And now I work at Walk Through the Bible, not just for Walk Through the Bible. And it's been my privilege to become the global children's ministry coordinator and here's what that means. I'm on Zoom a lot. <laughs> but I have the privilege of working with a team of people all around the world, and we're going to share what you're going to hear today with 1.3 million children this year around the world in a number of countries, and it's really fun. So if I act a little childish today, well, get over it. No. <laughs> I, that's my world. And I think that we have more learning when we have fun. And we'll remember things when we're actively involved in the learning. So, be warned. Y'all might get to move a little bit today. But it'll help you hang on to what we're talking about. I have to do something right now. If I offend somebody, I'm sorry. I can't deal with this any longer. <laughs> I've never been known to be able to deal with a pulpit. 
We're going to talk today about the Old Testament. We're going to start at the beginning of it, and we'll work right on through to the end of it. And as we do so, we're going to put together 40 significant story points that help paint the big picture for us together. And so the reason we do that is because, oh, let's see if we're going to work. Oh, oh, oh. Did I do something? I need to be freed up. Ah, did you do that or did I do that? Okay. Oh, you freed me. Thank you. Ah. Sometimes the Bible is a little bit of a puzzle to us. We've heard the story of Gideon. We know about David and that, how he took out that big giant. And, and we, we've heard about this and that. But how it all fits together sometimes can be a little confusing. Our Bible wasn't given to us in chronological order. It's written in sections. In fact, it kind of looks, well, not quite like that. Mine doesn't have all the colors in it. But it, it has a section of history. It has a section of poetry. And then finally, there's a section of prophecy. And even that is divided up. The first five books of history are called the Pentateuch, or the Law, the books of Moses, and then they put a committee together and they tried to figure out what to call the other 12 books of history. And finally, they just came up with the name Other History Books. <laughs> then there are five books of poetry. And then there are 17 books of prophecy at the end. And the first five of those are called the major prophets because they're big. And the other 12 are called the minor prophets because they're small. They're all important, they're all valuable. But if truth be told, sometimes in our Bibles, the minor prophets are the white pages. They're the ones we haven't highlighted, underlined, or read very often. And sometimes the pages are even stuck together. <laughs> but they're full of really good things. So my recommendation to you is to read all of the Bible. I read through it every year. I'm just one of those kinds of guys. I like a goal, I get to the goal. But as you read through the scripture, every time something new will jump out at you. I have read some stories in the Bible dozens of times, and yet something new comes out and grabs hold of me. Just two weeks ago, I was looking at Philippians in the New Testament, and as I was reading along, all of a sudden in chapter one, Verses 9 and 10 just grabbed me. And Paul was writing a prayer to the people in Philippi that he dearly loved and had visited a dozen years earlier. And that prayer was so valuable that I said, God, I need that prayer in my life. And so something I had read over and over and over all of a sudden was fresh and new in my life. And I've been literally praying that prayer every day since then. Asking God to help me be the light I'm supposed to be for him in this world we live in. So reading God's word is so special. When we start reading the Old Testament, we start in Genesis. And we all know what it says. In the beginning, beginning God made everything. He spoke it into existence I like to build things. I built a house once. I built furniture. I built all kinds of things. But I needed plans. I needed all kinds of resources. God is so amazing. He literally just spoke all that is into existence. Everything. And you know he made lots of different things. The sun, the moon, the stars, sky, water, plants, animals. And all the spare parts were put together and made the duck-billed platypus. <laughs> all those things all fit together. And so because it's the first thing in our storyline, we're going to lump it all together and just use the word creation. So let's say that together. Creation. Okay, one more time. Creation. 
Now, that's not bad, is it? But we're going to learn 40 things. And it's going to be hard to hang on to 40 things if we just say the words. So we're going to actually put hand motions with those 40 things. So if you're writing, you might need to free up your fingers and put your hands in front of you. We have nothing in them because that's what God started with. And he made everything. And we demonstrate that by making it the big world that he made and saying, creation. creation. Okay, do that with me. Here we go. Creation. Okay, I saw a couple of things. We have a few flat earth people in the room. <laughs> <laughs> creation, okay? And then a couple of you I noticed have very small view of things. Creation. <laughs> we have a big God, a magnificent God, who did a magnificent thing when he made everything, and we need to have a big world when we say, creation. Oh, much better. Yeah, good. Uh, making me nervous here. Yeah, creation. No, no. Fantastic. Yeah, are you guys Okay. Did he hit you or anything? Or? Okay. Knocked off, my, uh, knocked off doing, Africa. Doing knocked <laughs> Africa right off the planet. Okay, that's serious. All right, we're just checking in there. All right. We try to do this as non-violently as possible, but we also want to get to know our neighbors so it all fits together. So, the final thing that God created was people. Man and woman made in his image that's pretty special turn to your neighbor and say you were made in God's image yeah isn't that something I work really hard to have that mindset because when I go out into the marketplace I don't live on your nice, peaceful, quiet island, okay? I run into people that sometimes don't resemble God very much. <laughs> and my wife would maybe say, sometimes I don't. But um, it's so important that we have a mindset that God views all of us as beings made in his image. Do we agree about everything? Do we do everything the same? No way. We, we live in the United States. We have polar opposites of everything. But we're, when we interact with people, we're made with image bearers of God. It's significant. So Adam and Eve, the first man and woman, were placed in a beautiful garden. And that garden was amazing. It was peaceful. It was a place where God literally walked and talked with them. But there was a tree in the middle of the garden. That, that one right there. And uh, God said, Adam, Eve, don't go over and eat the fruit off of that tree. But you understand that that didn't work out so well because on that tree... <laughs> was fruit that was very appealing, <laughs> okay, and, uh, and we know how Satan came to Eve and right from the get-go said, uh, you can't really trust what God tells you. He doesn't always maybe mean what he says, and just takes the truth and takes it a little off center. And that so often happens in our world today, too. But Eve ate that fruit, Adam ate that fruit, and the whole world got turned upside down. They fell out of God's favor. They fell out of their relationship with God. They were cast out of that garden, and the whole world endured something that it hadn't experienced before. Pain. Pain. Suffering. 
The big theological word is fall. The fall of mankind. So after we say creation, we let our hands fall. Do that with me. Creation, fall. Well, they're kicked out of the garden. They start having children who have children who have children who have, you know how that works. And pretty soon there are quite a few people around. And in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, it says, God looked down on the world he created and said, yuck. All the thoughts of every person were continually evil. What a terrible thing. So God decided to flush the whole works and start over. But before they turned the water on, they saw Noah. And God said, he is faithful. I will redeem him and his family. And so you're very familiar with the story how Noah went out in his backyard and put together a little boat one and a half football fields long and how two of every animal came on board the door closed and it rained more than it rains in the Pacific Northwest <laughs> you poor Californians didn't know what you were getting into <laughs> my wife came out here from Wisconsin when we were first married and she said oh it's so green and I said, there's a price for that. <laughs> and she didn't go outside for two weeks. But anyway, um, it rained and rained, and God flooded the whole world, and only Noah and his family were saved. And so the way we demonstrate is we kind of let the waters flow a little bit, and then take them right up over our head and say, la 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 Let's do that together. -la 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 -la. Oh, it's so nice. Here we go together. Creation. Fall. -la 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 -la. Great. It was so good. The earth was renewed. It was starting over. They came off the ark and God said, Noah, let's do it right this time. Come on. Spread out. Fill the earth with people. Take dominion and take care of the world. And so Noah and his family grew and grew and grew, and they stayed right there. Now, I understand that some of us guys don't always follow all the directions. It's Noah's fault. He did not follow the directions. And because of that, the world became a mess again. And all the people were gathered together and they started to feel kind of special. Yep, we're all that. And we're so special, I think we should build a big old tower up into the sky. And then we can always say, look what we did. And, oh, there's home. I don't want to get lost and get too far away. But God said, you didn't quite do it the right way. And I think it might have played out a little like this. One day up on the 32nd floor, Frank is building away. ka chunk ka -chunk. Ah! Out of nails for my nail gun. A lot of technology back then. Hey, Ernest! Set up some more nails from a nail gun. Que pasa? No. Habla espanol? Buddy, you've been out in the sun too long. <laughs> Something wrong here. George, did you hear him? Sprechen Sie Deutsch? 
And they had a problem on the building site. Because God said, I'd like you to follow my plan. So he separated them into nations with different languages, and they spread throughout the world, which was God's plan all along. And so all the people that spoke Nissan, Kawasaki, Yamaha, all went off to an island in the Pacific and started building guitars and cars and things. And then the people that spoke the original language, England, English, um, you know, they went up into Northern Europe and it just all spread all over the place. And everything changed. And so we demonstrate that by putting our hands together and prying open the world and saying, nations. From the beginning. Creation. Fall. Flood. Nations. And you'll do it so much better if you rise to your feet for a second. Okay, here we go, all together. Turn to your neighbor and say, what have we gotten into? <laughs> all right, here we go. Creation. Fall. Flood. Nations, a little faster. Creation, fall, blood, nations. You want to go faster? Okay, here we go. All right. Creation, fall, flood, nations. Can you do it backwards? I'll show, I'll show you. Creation, fall, flood, nations. See, it's not that bad. Okay. Turn to your neighbor, do it one more time, and then be seated. All right. Okay, go ahead and have a seat. Some of you are wondering, what did Adam and Eve look like? So I put their picture up on the screen. Actually, this is my girlfriend, Julie. We're newlyweds in this church, I guess. We've only been married 41 years. You know, we can't keep up with 43. Uh, yeah, and... If we come back and do the New Testament, I'll bring her with me because she'd love to see you as well. She was, we have this little thing in our church called Vacation Bible School. Tomorrow, 500 kids are going to take over the church, and then we're going to try to manage that. And so she's in the, right up to here with all that stuff. Anyway, yeah, so that's my girlfriend. She's so cute. All right, we need to change our little setup here now. Give you a little bit of geography lesson. Those first four places all take place there. But now we're going to go right into the land of Israel. The cheapest Holy Land tour you'll ever be on. Okay? To do that, we're going to mess with the reality. We're going to say this part of the room is north. If that is north, what direction is back there? And this is? And east. Okay? Very good. All right. What's that corner back there? Southeast, you're doing great. The story picks up in that corner in the southeast. Yeah, it's great. So on our map, that is the north. Uh -huh. Oh, I see. Okay, so our story takes, starts out clear over here, what is called the Persian Gulf. Okay, and God meets with a man there named Abraham, and he and his family are going to go for a walk all the way up the valley, stay here a little while, and then end up all the way down here in the promised land, the land of Israel. And that's where we will spend the rest of our time together, in Israel. And we're going to pretend it's right here in the room. You sat in a perfect spot okay, good. to be the Sea of Galilee. <laughs> Do you want to wave at everybody? Okay, there. There's the Sea of Galilee. It's lovely, okay? Coming back and forth out of the bottom of that is a windy river called the Jordan River. And it empties into, amazingly, the Dead Sea right back here. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Considering everything, you look pretty good. Okay. And then over on this part of the room, you're all in the Mediterranean Sea. So kind of wave your arms. Yeah, those are the waves on the Mediterranean Sea. Yeah, very good. And then in the middle is just this little country called Israel. 
And that's where we're going to spend most of our time today. So, Abraham gets called by God. He leaves, follows God with his eyes of faith, comes around, finally lands in the promised land, and God visits him in a vision. He says, Abraham, I want to be your God, and I want you to be my people. A covenant relationship, an agreement together. In fact, Abraham, you're going to be the father of a huge nation of people. How exciting. Abraham is 90 years old. He's going to start having a big family with his 80-year-old wife, Sarah. Yes! And then nothing happened. So they did what a lot of people did. They uh, went an alternate route to build the family. And one of the servants in the home was an Egyptian gal named Hagar. She became a surrogate wife for Abraham. They buried, had a child that way named Ishmael. That was not the child God had promised. About 13 years later, God has visited, Abraham visits God visits Abraham again. He says, Abraham, now I'm going to fulfill the promise. Oh, this is great. I'm almost 100 years old. And my wife is almost 90 years old. And now we're going to have a family. And they didn't really believe it. In fact, Sarah. <laughs> These old bones are going to have a baby? And God said, why are you laughing? I, 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 I didn't laugh. Yeah, you did. And next year, you're going to hold a little baby in your arms. And next year, she did hold a little baby in her arms. And she named that little baby Laughter. Because that's what Isaac literally means. Laughter. I laughed at God, but he's turned that disbelief into just laughter of joy. So, Abraham has promised you're going to have as many children as the stars in the sky and the sand on the beach. So we say Abraham's name, we're going to throw some stars up there. Abraham. Do that with me. Abraham. And then we grab one of those stars and bring it down and say, Isaac. Isaac. Yeah. Abraham. Isaac. Isaac grows up gets married, has a family, he has twins. Woohoo! Got the bonus round. One of my friends at church, they had a couple girls, they were getting a little bit older, they said, let's have one more child, and then they had triplets. <laughs> he said, there is no such thing as peace in the world. <laughs> anyway, Isaac had twin sons, the first son's born, woo! It's all red and hairy. Takes after your side of the family. <laughs> yeah, they called him Esau, which kind of means red. Or... And then baby number two comes out, getting a free ride, holding on to the heel of his brother. His name was Jacob, and it kind of means he's a tricker, trickster, kind of a, always working the angles, and I tell you, he did. He stole his brother's birthright, he messed with his father-in-law. He even wrestled with God. That one hurt. Kind of walked away from that one a little bit sore. But God used Jacob to be the real genesis of the family as it grew together. So when we say Jacob, we just pretend we're wrestling and just say, Jacob! Jacob! So we started with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons and a daughter. Woo, he needed a big minivan or a yellow school bus. And the 11th son was Joseph. And we're privileged to have Joseph with us here today. 
Come on up. This is my brother, Alan. He, he volunteered, sort of, to do this. So stand right there and look cute. All right. Joseph was son number 11. He had 10 older brothers who thought they kind of were more important than him. But you can look forward. This won't hurt too much. Dad loved Joseph. Joseph was dad's favorite. He gave him a special coat with all these pretty colors. That really brings out the color of your eyes. That's nice. Yeah. Um, a special coat for him that kind of signified this is dad's favorite. You probably know this, but having favorites in your family doesn't usually play out very well. And for those of you that were your parents' favorite, the rest of us know, okay? Um, but, yeah. And so the brothers plotted against Joseph. They were done. They didn't like it very much. Well, then not only did Joseph have dad thinking he was special, God blessed Joseph with the ability to dream dreams and understand dreams. A very unique gift. I have dreams, they're meaningless. Joseph's dreams were important. So Joseph had a dream. And he went to his brothers. I'll do this part, okay? Right, yeah. Hey guys, guess what? <laughs> I just had a dream. Oh, Joseph, we've missed hearing about things with your life. What happened? Well, in, in my dream, we all were out in the field and we, were, we, we went and we cut our grain and we stacked up all of our grain and all your grain bowed down to me. Oh, thanks for sharing that. Really endearing dream with us. A little while later, I had another dream. Hey, guys, guess what? I had another dream. Oh, great. We love the last one. Yeah, in this dream, the sun, the moon, all the stars all bowed down to me. And that was enough. They said, this guy's got to go. And so... The circumstances came together. Joseph went to visit his brothers when they were way far home. They took his coat off. Oh, you were just getting to like it, weren't you? <laughs> they put some animal blood on it and sold Joseph as a slave. Slavery is an abomination from hell. It always has been and it is today. Our world is full of horrible trafficking that is terrible. You got trafficked. And we're going to go for a walk. Here we go, Joe. Joseph went down, all the way down, past the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River, down below the dead people, I mean the Dead Sea, all the way back down here, we're still coming. We're really, it's not easy to be taken away as a captive, is it? All the way down to Egypt. Now, Joe, I have some good news and some bad news for you. The good news is you do get to go back home. The bad news is it's in 400 years and you'll be a mummy. <laughs> but thank you. You can go back to your seat. Help me say thank you to Alan. All right. Everything changed then. The world was different for Joseph and his family. Eventually, Joseph goes from being a prisoner and a slave through a set of circumstances to being raised up to be second in command below Pharaoh over the whole land of Egypt. And God uses Joseph to rescue his people when there's a terrible famine in the land. We grab a hold of our coat lapels and say, Joseph goes to Egypt. Yeah. 
This is Joseph. So we learned four people. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. Let's put that together with the four things we learned at first by standing up. Put your hands in front of you and say with me, creation, fall, la la la, nations, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, be seated. I love how anything I do with my hands now, you think, I got to watch that one. That's the book of Genesis in a nutshell. But I want to stop for a minute and talk about Joseph as we finish our time together. Joseph's life was like a roller coaster. He was dad's favorite. He was sold as a slave. He was purchased and put in charge of Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's head guards, home. He was accused of an assault he didn't commit, left in prison until finally he was elevated up where he could serve the best. His life was highs and lows, highs and lows, highs. Our life is like that too. One of my friends said, you're either in a mess or you just came out of a mess or you're going to go into a mess. <laughs> but life is messy. There's a really special thing that happens toward the end of Joseph's life. His father, Jacob, dies, and Joseph's brothers are afraid because now there's no one to protect them for the horrible thing they did years earlier. And they come to Joseph and they say, Dad said you're supposed to be nice to us. Dad didn't say that. They're just covering their tail feathers. And Joseph says an amazing thing. He says, you, what you did to me, you meant for evil. But God meant it for good. Joseph could have hung on to that. He could have become a bitter man. But he was a better man. Because he saw God's hand in the good and the bad. Because he trusted God through every circumstance in his life. I don't know what your week was like this week. I went to three memorial services in the last eight days. Last Sunday afternoon, we put my dad in the hospital because his heart started going weird. He's only 94. I don't know what the issue is. But anyway, um, and it took till Thursday to find out what was wrong, and they plugged him with a pacemaker. But I spent all week driving back and forth to my mom's house to the hospital all week long amidst everything else I had going on. And tomorrow, I'm going to get assaulted by 500 kids at Vacation Bible School. It's really nice to be with you today. <laughs> I left all that stuff on the other side of the water. But I know this, that in the highs and in the lows, God does not change. He is the same yesterday as he is today, and he will be tomorrow. And I don't know what's going on in your world, what your circumstances are, what feels good, what feels bad. If you came into church today with a heavy heart, I don't know, but Almighty God does. And as we finish our time together this morning, Is there anything you need to let go of and put back in God's hands? Are you holding on to something that you need to release and let God do his best work in you and through you?
This is a really good time to do that. Let's pray quickly. Father, thank you so much for your word. It is so amazing and so powerful. Those are real people who went through real circumstances in their lives like we go through in ours. And yet, God, we have a choice to make when we go through those times. Do we cling to you and your promises? Or do we wallow in the hurt? God, help us to look to your face, reach up our hand and grab yours, and let you be the leader of our life. Thank you. Amen.